on today to uh, our press conference. My name is David McNeil. I'm a member of the uh, PAC committee at this club and a freelance journalist. Uh, well, uh, today's subject is uh, disturbing. You'll have seen the notice warning people that the documentary you've just shown or just seen uh, includes disturbing images. Uh, I'll just read the introduction to the press conference. Uh, Johnny Kitagawa uh, was the most prominent figure in J-pop when he died in July 2019. Uh, he ran Japan's most powerful talent agency, Johnny & Associates, which ignited the careers of some of Japan's best-loved pop acts of the last five decades, including Four Leaves, uh, Hikari Genji, SMAP, and Kinky Kids. Uh, but allegations of sexual misconduct uh, followed him persistently throughout his career. Uh, these claims, of course, as you saw in the documentary, uh, burst to the surface in 1999 when the weekly magazine Shukan Bunshun ran a series of articles uh, alleging uh, that Kitagawa systematically abused uh, young boys. They had 12 witnesses in total. Kitagawa sued the publisher, Bungei Shunju, but the Tokyo High Court overturned an earlier legal decision in July 2003, concluding that Kitagawa's legal team had failed to counter-argue the allegations in the detailed testimony of two of those victims, those young boys. Uh, his Kitagawa's appeal was finalized in 2005. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Johnny and Associates continued to manage a roster of young stars, and uh, Mr. Kitagawa was never charged. Uh, the few journalists who covered the story were angry with the mainstream media that they had ignored the scandal. And one of the issues that we hope to discuss today is why uh, Kitagawa's, the allegations against Mr. Kitagawa uh, continue to uh, be hidden. Uh, I just want to, uh, before we go over to the two makers of the documentary, I just want to have a few bookkeeping things. One is, please, again, I know you've been warned, no film or uh, video images or photographs are allowed of the movie. Uh, we're live streaming today uh, for anybody who wants to spread the word. We have uh, quite a number of people watching, but uh, if you would like to let people know that, that would be great. Uh, we are uh, hopefully going to speak via Zoom to the two makers of the documentary, that's Mobin Azar and Megumi Inman. Hi. Hello. Hi, Megumi. Hello. How are you? Oh, I'm, we're good, thanks. Good. Really we can good. see Thank you. you. Okay. Um, I appreciate you've got up very early for us, right? It's, what, 5 o'clock in the morning over there or something like that? <laughs> Just, Just 10 10 6. o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a million for that. Um, now, I understand you're both going to make a brief statement. Is that right? And then we're going to go to Q&A. All right. Who wants to go first? I'll kick it off, thanks. All right, Megumi. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Megumi Inman. I am the director and producer of this documentary, uh, Predator, The Secret Scandal of J-Pop. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you to the FCCJ for having us here. This was a very difficult film to make, so it's really great that it's having the impact it is in Japan and that we're finally talking about these issues openly. Um, I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes speaking about my experience investigating the story and how the BBC came to make it. And after that, Maveen has a few things to say and then we can move on to the Q&A. So to give you a bit of background about myself, I am mixed Japanese and British and I grew up in Japan. I spent my pre-teen and early teen years in Tokyo. So like every Japanese kid, um, Johnny's boy bands were a part of my everyday life. They can't not be. They're everywhere and embedded in Japanese pop culture. So this story is particularly close to me. And the more we digged into it, the more shocking and important it became to tell this story as full as we could. The BBC started looking into this in 2019 and it was actually Johnny's death um, in August 2019 that sparked this investigation. But then COVID hit and we had to put the investigation on ice. In early 2002, last year, when it, was look, uh, when it looked like Japan might open its borders, we picked up the investigation again. And last summer, we were able to come to Japan to film. 
So I hope that explains the timings of why we're bringing this documentary to you now. And lastly, while making this documentary, we were turned down by many institutions and organizations. Everyone had their own reason why they didn't want to talk. So I'm especially grateful to all the brave men, the survivors who did speak to us on and off camera. It takes a lot of courage to speak up against a powerful figure like Johnny Kitagawa, but they all did with the hope that this film would make a difference. So we're really pleased that this documentary is now available not only in Japan, but globally around the world on the BBC World News Channel. Here in Japan, you can watch it tomorrow, Saturday at 10 past six in the evening, and then on Sunday at 10 past five in the morning, 10 past 11 in the morning, and then on Monday at 10 past midnight. Thank you, um, I'll now pass it on to Mbeen. Thank Thanks. you, Thank you, me. Me. Thank you so much. Um, so I am really grateful to be with you today and uh, thank you to the FCCJ for organizing today's event. Uh, I was the reporter on the film, so I worked closely with uh, Megumi. My background really, I, I should just explain that. Um, I've been a journalist for almost 20 years. Predominantly my work has been with the BBC and I, I became a journalist because I believe really passionately in, in the concepts of journalism as public service and I believe in public service broadcasting. Now, a lot of the projects that I've worked on over the years, whether they're in the UK or whether they're international, have included an element of exploitation. So that could be within the context of, of drugs and drug trafficking. I've done a lot of projects related to that. It could be within the, the realm of terrorism and grooming. I've done lots of projects related to that. It could be within the realm of sexual exploitation uh, and sex work. And I've done lots of projects related to that. But this, this concept of exploitation has been a running theme. And in each of those contexts, and wherever I've done these films or made these projects or written these articles, there has been another consistent theme and that consistent theme has been silence. So that could be the silence of a given community. It could be the silence of an establishment. It could be the silence of people who have power, who stand to lose power. That has been another consistent theme. And so the first time I heard about the story of Johnny Kitagawa, was, was in 2019 and what really attracted me to the story and made me think it was something that I was interested in exploring was, was really this concept of exploitation, but also the, the silence. I think being on the ground with Megumi, I, I didn't expect the level of silence that we encountered and the brick walls we encountered in terms of organizations uh, journalists, corporations, um, people within the music industry being unwilling to share their experience. And often that was on record, which I think is sometimes understandable. Often it was off the record as well. So there was a complete kind of wall of silence in terms of people being willing to engage in any meaningful way. Um, I think though, I'm, I'm really pleased with the film because Ultimately, what we wanted to do is fuel discussion. And I think that has now started. So whether you see that in the online space or whether you see it within the, the select sections of Japanese press that have chosen to cover this story, or you see it in terms of the UK and the response to the airing of the film in the UK, that, that has now started. And I think that can only be a good thing. And just finally, I, I, I do want to, as Megumi said, express real gratitude, heartfelt gratitude to all the contributors who actually spent their time and were brave enough to talk about their experiences, regardless, and this is the thing I think for, for maybe an international audience, there could be a level of judgment in terms of how particular contributors see their experiences and how they process their experiences. Maybe the processing of those experiences doesn't match up to, to particular expectations and to what we assume 
their reading of a situation should be. Uh, regardless of that, I think all the contributors are hugely brave, and I think what they've what they've done is is amazing and requires uh, a huge degree of bravery, and we couldn't have done it without them. So I'm indebted to them, and uh, I'm really really grateful to them, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thanks very much. Well, before we move to questions, just uh, we'll just clear up the legal stuff first. So uh, first of all, we have a statement from the BBC, which I'll read out. Uh, the BBC is committed to highlighting important issues from around the world. Uh, this documentary investigates the little known story of Japanese pop mogul Johnny Kitagawa and his long history of sexual abuse. After the defamation trial, a civil court in Japan found it to be true that Kitagawa had sexually abused boys. The documentary hears from those who say Kitagawa sexually abused them and examines the real-life consequences to his victims when the media and society remain silent on the issue. It is entirely in the public interest to bring attention to the decades of sexual abuse Kitagawa's victims have experienced, particularly due to the influence he continues to have over Japanese pop culture. Uh, we should also say that <clears throat> we have contacted Johnny and Associates, uh, and we contacted them yesterday asking them if they would like to come and make a statement or respond to any of the allegations in the documentary. We're waiting for their reply. Uh, we do, of course, we're a forum for views, for people with different views, often clashing views. So we appreciate it's a controversial issue, but we have uh, invited Johnny and Associates to come and talk to us. Uh, with all that behind us, uh, I'll just scan the room. If anybody has a question, if you could put up your hand Indicate who you are and then come to the mic. Uh, tell us your affiliation and your question. Thanks very much. I see Will's hand first. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Will Fee of the Japan Times. Um, <clears throat> Mabin mentioned um, the, the silence and brick walls that he'd encountered making this film. And I, I think the, the, the phrase he used was uh, that it was hard to wrap his head around, you know, which is a really understandable reaction. Um, Mabin, were you previously aware of issues limiting Jap Japanese press freedom, um, particularly when covering the rich and powerful? And Megumi, having grown up here, were you surprised by the extent of uh, those limits making this film? Thank you. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Will. Um, so, so I would say um, I had a semblance, a semblance of an understanding of the limitations on press freedom. Um, I hadn't worked in Japan before, but I'd, I'd visited Japan. And whenever I, I visit a place, I'm interested in how local press works. And I'd had some of those conversations and I'd, 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 I'd read and understood uh, a little bit about press freedoms. I think I'd, I'd really underestimated the extent to which that would affect <coughs> reporting of a story which is ultimately you know if if we kind of flatten it all down and just take the bare bones of the story i believe this is a story about the powerful and people who have less power being exploited so i believe there's a power dynamic at play in this story and i think i'd underestimated how difficult it was for for press inside japan to to kind of uh, shift through that and power through that and report these stories. I think for me it was a it was a learning experience and and uh, Megumi certainly was on the ground for a long time before I got to Japan. So we'd have lots of editorial conversations going backwards and forwards. And then Megumi was on the ground. I think for maybe three weeks before I got to Japan to start the shoot. And the the theme of Japanese press not covering this story, but I think was probably one of the, the predominant conversations we had for, for weeks and months beforehand and during the planning. I, I think there's always, you know, I'm an eternal optimist. So I think being on the ground, I always think that regardless of, you know, perhaps there being a language barrier, perhaps there being a, a different culture, perhaps there being a different etiquette, I always assume that I'm going to, be able to charm my way in. I'm going to be able to have, uh, you know, great conversations, and I'm going to be able to kind of get through that wall of silence. And um, I was really shocked, actually, at how on the ground, predominantly, that didn't happen. 
I do want to say though, you know, whether they were on film or whether it was during the research process, there are grassroots level journalists within Japan who are doing brilliant work. And of course, you know, it would be completely wrong to not mention the, the brilliant journalists at uh, Bunshin who did speak, I'm sure you, you saw them in the film, you know, and ultimately uh, 20 years ago, they were looking at this story. Um, and I think, you know, it would be wrong to say there aren't brilliant people inside Japan who, who are doing this work and who are speaking out and who are joining those dots. But to answer your question, I was, I was shocked at the, the level of, of brick walling and the level of silence. Thank you. Megumi? Uh, yeah, to follow on from Mabin. So yeah, I, um, uh, having grown up in Japan and I work in Japan quite a lot, when <clears throat> we were starting this investigation, I knew this was going to be a hard topic to get people to open up and talk about. Um, but I think I did underestimate how scared people were um, to to talk about and, and, and even meet me, speak to me. Um, and, you know, in Japan, there is a I've growing up there, I know there's people are very conscious about reading the room, um, but this was on a uh, another level. Um, and I think the other thing that surprised me was just to what extent this was still understood as a, a myth, an urban legend, almost. It was um, sort of put into like celebrity gossip and wasn't really seriously treated as what we saw as child abuse. Um, and so that was another surprising uh, thing for me. Thank you. Um, if you'll allow me one question um, to both of you, really, I guess. Uh, as you know, the case that this often gets compared to is uh, Jimmy Savile in the UK. Uh, Jimmy Savile, of course, kind of hid in plain sight, didn't he? Because he was one of the top celebrities in the UK for many years in the 70s. And 80s, he was the uh, presenter of Jim Will Fix It, very popular show on the BBC, and also Top of the Pops. Um, how far do you think those comparisons go? Because, you know, the I've seen people online accusing the BBC of hypocrisy, saying, well, it's all very well and good for you to come over here and investigate a scandal in Japan, but what about the scandal on your own doorstep? Uh, so uh, let me ask that question to both of you and see how you respond. Sure. Megumi, can, can I can I take that first? Yeah, please do. Be... So, so I think um, I think that comparison and and any comparison to Jimmy Savile or Weinstein or R. Kelly or any of the the kind of recent historic cases is is entirely fair. Actually, I think those comparisons automatically, when we hear a story as abhorrent as this. It is only natural in terms of how the human mind works to try to process this stuff in terms of what what feels like stories that we have had some semblance of of digesting and unpicking as a society so i think those comparisons are fair and i think where where they're entirely justified is like johnny kitagawa jimmy savile was often seen as uh, a national institution. He was seen as someone who had this national treasure status. Um, and anyone who's kind of followed that case in recent years will see there was this kind of <clears throat> unholy triangle almost in terms of uh, Buckingham Palace had relationships with Jimmy Savile. He was going to garden parties at Buckingham Palace. And so therefore governments, there was this assumption that, well, if if Buckingham Palace has a relationship with him, everything must be fine. So then government was inviting him to Downing Street in the years of Margaret Thatcher. You know, so he was in Downing Street. There were often pictures of him on the steps of Downing Street doing, quote unquote, you know, great work for the community. And then the third part of that triangle was the press. And yes, it was the BBC. So he had a job at the BBC. And there was an assumption, I think, between all three of those institutions that he must be okay and everything must be fine because that you know he he is in with these major institutions of society so i think all that is fine what i think is unfair is the idea and we often hear it i think when people don't want to talk about a particular issue that's in the public domain we often hear this idea of go and sort your own house first 
I think that's entirely unfair because, I mean, let's be frank about it. I'm, I'm an 80s child. So as a journalist myself, uh, you know, no one journalist can, can sort all the ills or shine a light on all the ills of, of the world. And in terms of quote unquote, sorting out your own house first, you know, I think these conversations uh, about exploitation, about sex abuse, about people within the uh, public eye exploiting their positions of power, I think those conversations should happen and need to happen everywhere in every context. I don't think there's good exploitation and bad, bad exploitation. I think all exploitation is bad. And if, if that's happening in the UK, then it needs to be spoken about. I think historically with the Jimmy Savile case, it is undeniable that there were mistakes that were made. And it's undeniable that the, uh, the story should have come out earlier. It only came out once again because there were brave people who were prepared to share their experiences. There were journalists doing good work, the establishment in the end, and it was the press. And I think it was ITV that brought the story in the end, um, you know, effectively decide to roll up their sleeves, do their job and cover this story. And I think wherever that happens and whatever context that happens in, whether it's the press from a particular country or it's press from outside that country, I think that can only be a good thing. I think that can only be a good thing. And so I, I do buy the comparison. What I don't buy is this idea that uh, this story should have been left and it shouldn't have been co covered by journalists from the BBC. I don't agree with that at all. Thanks, Mubeen. Um Megumi, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, not too much. I think Mubeen summarised it perfectly. The only small thing I would add is um, I think it actually took an outsider to be able to tell this story um, because uh, there, there were too many relationships um, between the agency and the media within Japan and further afield. I think it actually took someone outside like the BBC to be able to tell the story that didn't have ties um, and to tell it fairly and for a place uh, for it to be a place where survivors could come and and trust trust us and, and know that their story would be told fairly. Thank you very much. Um, well, we have questions uh, lined up online. Uh, just let me scan the room. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, can you show your hand so I'll know that you want to ask one? The gentleman in front. Um, first, if you uh, come to the microphone, please. Onigashimasu. <coughs> Uh, I'm Toshi Ogata with uh, Arc Times online uh, publication here in Japan. Um, I have two questions. So, one number one is that the I would I, I would thank you very much for your great work and in, in, investigative documentary, and I really appreciate it. And I and I myself I, I'm shocked to see the the in, uh, the gravity of the situation. Actually, I was at the uh, Asahi Shimbu major Japanese newspaper until last June. And uh, so at, at the time, back in 2000, I, I was at Asahi for 29 years. And I, was, I have been a business reporter mainly. So that area was a remote area for me. But uh, we have 2,000 reporters. But, but uh, I, just real, I, I didn't read much about the uh, uh, weekly Bunshun at the time, and I know the rumor, but I didn't realize that the, there was a ruling in, in, that mag, on, in that magnitude. And uh, actually, the cross-examination of, of Johnny Kitagawa himself, I didn't realize that. So I'm, I'm ashamed of my, myself to see this, and I, I, I thought I should have spoken up do at the time. Uh, do you have a question, yeah. Ogawa-san? Yes, yes. So my question is that the, from your point of view, uh, so you saw the, all the uh, brick walls and uh, uh, tight-lipped Japanese media. And as you pointed out, Japanese media was a huge part of this problem. So from, from your uh, point of view, wh what do you make of the, the, Jap the attitude or atmosphere of Japanese me media compared to like, the media in the UK or the rest of the world? That's my first question. Thank I you very much. Do you have another question? Yes. Okay. Do, do, do you guys want to um, 
Do you want to address that question? For, well, why don't you ask your second question? Okay, then? okay. So second question is about, about actually about Jimmy Saville, uh, as you point, uh, raised. So I, I just, uh, I, I read the report, in, independent report uh, commissioned by BBC. Uh, I think it's back in 2012. And I, I saw the statement by the director of the uh, investi investi investigative committee, but I'm not really aware of the, any documentary on that by BBC. So, did you do did, did you do this type of documentary at the BBC by 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 BBC itself? And if not, is it still difficult for you guys to discuss this? to raise the, the possibility to this type of uh, documentary on Jimmy Saville. Thank you. So I see two questions. One is the different attitudes of the media in Japan, outside Japan, toward this case. And the second one is, has the BBC got to grips with this? I know there is a drama planned, isn't there? The BBC has a, is making a drama at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, scheduled for release. But I'll let you guys answer that question. Mike, do, do you want to yeah. come in first? Yep. I can so go in first. So uh, just about the attitude towards the media, to be honest, I, I can't really speak too much about the British media. I've been focused so much on this story. I can feel more comfortable talking about that. Um, one thing that really is surprising is just how powerful Johnny's and Associates is and how prevalent and omnipotent their, their, their presence is. They're, it's not only music they are in every popular at least one of their talent is on every popular drama show they're on when whenever you flick any channel there will be a johnny's boy on one of the channels um at least they are on adverts they they are you cannot escape them um and i think that is something that uh it's hard to find a comparison to in the um uk and so you can start to see why um, perhaps the media is so dependent, or not dependent, but starts to have a very strong and reliant relationship um, with this talent agency. Um, as for Jimmy Savile, um, I can't, I, I, I can't say, I, I can't name any documentaries off the top of my head. I feel like there have been, but uh, maybe Mabin has known a bit more um, about that. Sure. So thank you for the question. So I guess there was two parts to that question. So first, in terms of the comparison between uh, UK and, and Japanese press, I would say absolutely that there are comparisons that can be made. And this is just my, my personal opinion. But I think quite often, in terms of public discourse, journalists are seen as um, a, a kind of specific breed of person. Whereas in actual fact, as journalists in the room or journalists watching online right now, uh, you know, I'm sure we can all say with confidence that journalists actually often just represent a cross section of society, which means they're also susceptible to things like groupthink. Journalists are also susceptible to their, their logic in working out a story being affected by the prevailing logic of the moment, the prevailing logic of the time. Of course, you know, we're, we're human beings and that's how, that's how the human mind works. And so I think those comparisons are entirely fair. What that means in a practical sense with a story like this is if all your colleagues around you and the prevailing narrative is, we might have heard rumors, but let's just say they're rumors. And this is a story that no one wants to touch. And there must be a reason for that. Then that is going to affect the work of lots of journalists. Of course it is. And you know, do I think there's a comparison there um, in terms of what happened in uh, Japan with Johnny Kitagawa? Yes, I do. You know, the fact is that Bunshin did report this story. And of course, we know about the libel case. We know what was upheld in, in the courts in Tokyo. Uh, we know that the allegations of sexual abuse, you know, effectively were spoken about in court. I, so I think the distinction is in the Jimmy Savile case that that didn't happen. There wasn't a court case. There wasn't a libel case. Claims weren't upheld in courts. I think that's the distinct difference. But journalists are often guilty of groupthink. And I think there's a lesson for that for every single one of us, including me. I think every single one of us, as journalists, we do our jobs better if we are interrogating 
the established narrative. And I think that's something that we should all be aiming to do. The second part of that question was about Jimmy Savile and the BBC in 2012. So specifically, um, I think many people in the room may have seen, uh, I think it's a three part Netflix film that was made using lots of BBC archive. Um, in house at the BBC, this subject has been covered on outlets like uh, Newsnight. Um, famously, there was a panorama that was delayed, but then did make it to air. And it's been covered by lots of the BBC news, the BBC website and so forth. So I think, I think absolutely in terms of working practices and in terms of the BBC, there has been a reckoning and there is this constant kind of asking of questions of, of why this wasn't reported earlier. But again, you know, just in terms of the facts of the case and the chronology of the case, I think the distinct difference is in the case of Jimmy Savile, there weren't legal proceedings. In the case of Johnny Kitagawa, there were, and we all know about those, and they were in the public <laughs> space. That would make that distinction. Thank you. That's a good point. I mean, the the <clears throat> there may not have been a documentary, a standalone documentary on the BBC, but it was covered in multiple programs. That's a key difference, isn't it, if you <clears throat> think about the NHK comparison? Just to answer my own question about the drama, I just was, when you were talking, I was researching it. Uh, there's a drama which is about the Jimmy Savile case, which is due to be uh, aired on the BBC this year, uh, but there has been some allegations. The Sun, for example, claimed that BBC executives were concerned about putting the show on air before the coronation of King Charles. <clears throat> so because of uh, Jimmy Savile's connection to King Charles, uh, there was concern or debate within the BBC about that. Um, I, I think uh, that shows that it's still a difficult subject, but it doesn't show blank censorship, which is what the question was getting at. Um, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go to this Jimmy Savile thing again because a lot of the questions refer to that, and hopefully this will be the last one. If I can indulge your patience, uh, this is from uh, this is an online question from Ronald Taylor of Nante Japan, N A N T E. Uh, why did you make this documentary now, years after Kitagawa's death? Is this documentary a way of atoning for the BBC's treatment of Jimmy Savile's similar case? I mean, you've already dealt with it, but you just want to sort of finally deal with that issue and then we'll move on yeah yeah sure um Go on, I, I, sorry no no i mean i'm just going to be re repeating myself uh a little bit here but um the yeah the 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 johnny kitagawa is a powerful figure and it's someone that the bbc have um reported on him before for uh usually you know the many um um, sort of business accolades that he has, but there's always been underneath. We've always said that there have been allegations, sexual allegations to his name. Um, it was in 2019 when he died. The response to his death in Japan, he was celebrated as a national hero. You know, he was revered, and so, um, but and, and very few media outlets in Japan looked at that other side of him that we had um also that had also been where we had looked in uh mentioned about the sexual allegations um so that was the beginning that that's what sparked it was the fact that um there was just no highlighting of his sexual abuse it was all positive all just very revering um and i and uh that's what kick, kicked it off um but like i said the reason why we're showing it now is because um, of COVID, we can come over here uh, to Japan for a few years. Got it. Okay. Maybe do you want to add anything to really that? Really briefly, I just uh, I just want to say I think I've just found out the BBC actually did do a documentary about the Savile case that went out in 2016, um, and uh, I think it was called "Abused: The Untold Story." I think it was a 90 minute film. I don't know if that's the the the, the drama or the doc, but there was actually a doc in 2016. Okay, well, that's the end of that. Um, Catherine, you have a question? Thank you. And again, reminder, I do have questions online. If you want to ask a question in the room, can you show your hand? Indicate you want to speak. Thank you. Hello, I'm Catherine Jane Fisher, author, and thank you for this documentary. And I have been an advocate in Japan since 2002. So up until 20 years ago, there was no 24-hour rape crisis center. There were no uh, rape test kits. 
And it is only until recently, in 2007, that the penal code was adjusted to um, address, sorry, to include men. So my question is, Japan is leading the world in many different areas, yet so behind in addressing sexual violence. So um, compared to the UK, and when you came here, how did you feel the support was, especially for the men, the victims, as some of the victims themselves were actually uh, expressing a trauma bond? And so how did you, what do you think the support, the support was for the victims here? Trauma bond means that they were still uh, They still feel loved affection. Kitagawa. Towards <clears throat> yeah. the perpetrator. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Captain. Thanks. Mobin, do you want to go first, or? Sure. Yeah, if that's all right, Meg. Sure. Cool. Um, so I think I think it's a really important point, and I think it's a really important uh, theme in in the documentary. Um, the phrase that you use, trauma bond. I think this is something that, as as a public, and certainly me as an individual. I think we're only understanding uh, in in recent years, and I think you know one one key example, and I think the first time I ever really saw it discussed in in public mm. was following the documentary Leaving Neverland, the the Michael Jackson film, and I remember watching that, and I think a, a lot of people in the public space uh, criticised uh, survivors of abuse in that context because famously, I think uh, it was Wade Robinson that had testified in defense of Michael Jackson at a previous court case. And so that was used by some to, to, to make an attack and to belittle his testimony. And I think, you know, for any right thinking person or person that's interested in nuance, if you then unpick that case, and if you then unpick the kind of timeline of events, you understand this idea of survivors of abuse, regardless of gender, um, sometimes, and indeed often, being linked and still having feelings for their abuser. I think in the research for Predator, and before we came out to do the shoot, I was, and, and Megumi and I would have these discussions and we'd talk about this stuff. And so there was an element of being prepared to hear these stories. And of course, Megumi did um, you know, lots of amazing work and lots of amazing research. And, and we were having conversations about that all the time. Nevertheless, when you're sitting down with a contributor who is talking about what I certainly would perceive as abuse and a power imbalance, and yet they don't see it in those terms, and they'll go further, in fact. And as you saw in the film, you know, there were references to particular individuals saying, I still love Johnny Kitagawa. You know, I know what happened. Some of them said they witnessed what happened. Some of them said they'd heard about it. Some of them indeed had experienced it themselves. And then there's phrases thrown out there about a kind of amorous connection, a sense of love. When you're confronted with that, of, of course it's shocking. But what do we know? You know, we say this in the film, that is exactly how grooming works. It is the person with the power, it is the person that is doing the grooming that will create this relationship in which the person that's being exploited believes that there's a special relationship, a special bond, a special secret. And everything that I know about this story and everything that I know from speaking to survivors is Johnny Kitagawa did exactly that. He was a master manipulator. He, he, was, he very successfully manipulated young men and boys and created this what was seen to be a special bond and that means and i think this is this is one of the the lessons from this and it's one of the saddest things for me is i think many of the people who who spoke to us are still in the process of 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 getting to the point where they actually believe that there was a power imbalance and even being able to use a word like abuse as you saw in the film many of them wouldn't use that word and keep in mind those are the people that spoke on camera. Those are the people that actually felt confident enough and you know, were brave enough to share their stories. And so it does really concern me that there will be other men out there who are not even at that stage, who are not even at the stage where they can say, okay, maybe something went on here. Mm. I think that's a real concern and a real problem. Thank you. Megumi, do you want to add anything to that or are you okay? Oh, no, that's okay. It's 
but all right thank you okay great thanks <clears throat> thanks Catherine uh, anybody else in the room want to ask a question uh, the gentleman at the back <clears throat> thank you <clears throat> Kind of a continuous amateur historical scholar. Um, this is a very dramatic film, and I really respect FCCJ because I'm so much disappointed about the Japanese, uh, what do you call it, Japanese major, major press. There's very little freedom of press, and the Japanese press really make sontaku uh, in Japanese. So there's a big issue now about the government pressing the Japanese press right now in the diet, but the real problem is uh, the kind of uh, nature of the Japanese press who don't really, uh, who really don't put it in the paper, and also like, like in your case, they don't bring the American foreign uh, uh, journalists into the club, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. So uh, this was very interesting, but my real, <laughs> What, which is the issue? This sexual harassment case is horrendous, and they should do it. But for me, the bigger question is the deterioration and kind of ugliness of the Japanese press institution. Is that your question? So you're so, asking about... Yeah, so, so which is... So I think BBC, <laughs> this is a great... Uh, this is a great what you, what you call, presentation, but maybe shifting to to the attack to the Japanese press and how there's no press freedom in the Japanese society, this is much more important to the okay. Japanese people. Okay, so so I guess if we could just um, make it, reframe it as a question. So you, there's two parts to the documentary. One is about the physical abuse that yeah. Kitagawa uh, perpetrated or allegedly perpetrated. And then the other question is about the media itself. And I guess th those were the two strands in your documentary, right, Megumi? Uh, yes, those are the main two strands. Uh, obviously, the the systemic child sexual abuse is was one is is horrific in itself, but um, just as surprising and 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 harrowing was the the silence, the complicit silence mm -hmm. times as well that um, that followed it for, for for decades. We're talking here for decades, fifty, sixty years. But I also think there were other themes to it as well, which which was which Mabin touched upon was the the lack of vocabulary and discussion around what sexual abuse is. Um, so, for example, you know, I don't think in Japan the word grooming is really an ex a word that exists. It's it's a word that even in in the UK it, it's sort of come into our vocabulary recently. But I certainly found it difficult speaking to um, people in Japan explaining what grooming. Um, was because it's just something that hasn't been talked about, um, and so so that was one thing. I think also the way that um, children are protected in this case. Um, so uh, when it comes to sexual abuse in Japan, is is also alarming, and how uh, whether the police looked into any of these um, allegations at the time when when Ben Bunshin reported on this. Um, you know that was something that we also found. Uh, to be uh, shocking as well. So definitely, the media um, is is a big was a big theme. But there were other themes as well, which um, we felt were were also really really important and and you know touches upon everyone's lives in Japan. Thank you, Mobin. I think Megumi covered it. That's fine. Thank okay. You. Okay. Well, let me read out a question from online then. This is from uh, Ilgin Yorumaz. She's with uh, your sister organization, BBC World Turkish. Uh, she says, um, well, are there any other plans to show this documentary in other languages covered by BBC World? So will it be shown in uh, different languages other than English and Japanese, obviously? Uh, the second question is, has anyone from the Japanese government, police, judiciary, commented on the documentary in a positive or negative way. Have you had any feedback from Japan at all since you broadcast it a couple of weeks ago? Okay. Uh, um, I can take this, if that's okay, Mavi. Um, uh, so sure. Sure. whether it's going to be shown in other languages, so it will be shown on BBC World News, which reaches out to over 200 countries, 300 million households. Um, we will have a Japanese um, 
subtitle version, whether that's uh, whether it's going to be subtitled into other languages, I personally do not know. Um, but it is a brilliant that is going out across, um, this is going out globally. Feedback from Japan, it's been, the, 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 the reaction that we have had on social media is overwhelming. Um, and it has often been um, sort of echoing what some of the, the, the voices that we have heard in, in today's forum today of, of I didn't know that this was true. Um, I can't believe that it, it, it hasn't been reported before. And yeah, why is the BBC doing this? And why has it taken a foreign media outlet to report such a big story um, about Japan? So, so it has been, I would say, overwhelmingly positive on social media. Uh, when it comes to the other media outlets, um, mainstream media outlets of Japan, a bit like when we try to contact them for interviews for the programme, uh, it's been quiet, if not silent. Uh, Mobin, do you want to add anything to that? I, th I think Mugumi's covered it. Thank you. Right. Well, I probably should mention at this point that the reason why we're having this press conference is because I tweeted out a link to the documentary fairly absentmindedly. I tweeted a lot of stuff and it got 18 million hits, which never happens on my Twitter account. <laughs> uh, I was really astonished that there was just this uh, demand, I guess, or hunger for more information on uh, the, the contents of your documentary. Um, uh, another... I, I should just say, I've, I've just, um, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting uh, a WhatsApp from the exec on the film who's, who's very helpfully said the World Service languages will be showing the doc in various languages. Okay. So it will be translated. All right, that's good news. Um, uh, one more question from uh, Ilgin Yolomaz of BBC. Uh, claims of sexual harassment at the hands of their caretakers are rife in Japan, but the issue is seen as taboo. Were you surprised by the lack of scrutiny by the Japanese police, uh, despite years of allegations? So we've focused so far on the media, um, but uh, I guess the police should take a hit too, right? Because they didn't follow up. Yeah. Yeah. So if if I could if I could say this, I know in Japan there's there's a kind of I would say a fairly unique system whereby the the police wouldn't speak to us. And primarily the reason for that wasn't a kind of, we don't want to talk about this subject. It was more to do with a, it was a kind of logistical kind of rules-based reason. And as, as many people will know, unless you're a foreign correspondent that's based in Japan, you simply can't have that interaction with police. And I found that incredibly frustrating um, because I, I, I have uh, interviewed police in, in Pakistan, in the UK, in Mexico, in the US, in Canada, you know, in various jurisdictions. And I've, I've, I've done interviews with, with lawyers, with uh, law enforcement, with police themselves. All of that stuff is, is entirely possible. So this, this specific, specific ruling in Japan, I'm not sure, and I, you know, I can't speak on the police's behalf, of course, but I think what it does do is it allows the police in very specific contexts to avoid foreign scrutiny. And certainly, you know, the fact that they, they wouldn't speak to us and the fact that they're, you know, maybe there was an investigation following the libel case. We're, we're never going to know that. Perhaps that was done behind closed doors. But what we know with absolute certainty is following the libel case, which is what al almost 20 years ago, that what we know with certainty is there wasn't a prosecution. We know there wasn't a prosecution of Johnny Kitagawa. And that to me is, of course, it's shocking. And I would say it's unforgivable because this at the time was in the public domain. And so in that moment, I have been... I, I find it very difficult to wrap my head around this idea of why there was no prosecution. You know, whether that prosecution would have been successful or not is an entirely separate matter, but it is the job of the police. Again, you know, I go back to what I said right at the start, the idea of public service. The police, ultimately, as an institution, of course, is about protecting the public. It is about public service. And so I find it extremely shocking that there was no prosecution. Thank you. Megumi? No, Mabi said it all. 
All right, thank you. Uh, just scanning the room again to see if anybody has a question. If you have, can you raise your hand, please? Let us know you want to ask one. Um, we uh, see, we haven't mentioned the N word yet, um, guys. NHK, <laughs> seeing as how you know the the obvious comparison with the BBC would be NHK, another powerful public service broadcaster. You've also mentioned. Uh, you know, in many contexts, public service, the notion of public service. Um, do you think that um, Japan's public service broadcaster uh, is on the hook here as well? Do you think they uh, deserve some of the blame for this, what happened, for not digging into it? Um, yeah, I'll, I, could say this. Um, I think both Mabin and I are very supportive of public broadcasters um, and NHK does do great work as well on this scenario on this case I do it does make me wonder why they wouldn't want to um, well they didn't report on it back then but also when we uh, approach them and you know to ask for their comments for their response to see what they had to say about it um, we were uh, politely declined and um, and I see that uh, Johnny's talent uh, frequently are on their network, on their broadcasting system. So it isn't something that's not to do with them. Um, and so I do, I do wonder why that they don't um, want to talk to us. And I find it troubling. All right, thank you. Um, last question online. This comes from Rui Jodai of um, Netorabo. Uh, did you apply for an interview with, uh, you've already said you applied, but you were refused by the police. Uh, did you apply for an interview with any other media apart from NHK and Chukam Bunshun? Uh, again, I, I can take this, that's okay, Mabin. Um, we approached far and wide to all sorts of media outlets in Japan. We um, I can't list them all, um, but to name a few, we did reach out to NHK. We reached out to the four major um, broadsheets, so Asai Shimbun, Yumiuri, Sanke, and Mainichi. Um, we spoke to, we reached out to entertainment reporters, TV producers, music producers. Um, some people, few, spoke to us um, off the record, and and that they they were they was you know quite. I'd say scared to do so, but they bravely did. Um, and but most of them, including the major um, outlets that I just mentioned, all um, politely declined, and um, uh, they all had their own reasons why they didn't want to speak to us. Thank you. And you uncovered or you located one former victim, is that right? In total, who spoke on the record. We spoke to well in our film we uh, there are three, three survivors. Okay, and do you do you have any idea of how many there were in total? Do you, has anybody speculated on that? I mean, obviously, if three people spoke to you, there are very many more. In reality, right? Oh, I mean, it's 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 I can't even imagine how many there's. Uh, it's really, if you think about how many boys go through that agency and how it is sort of a revolving door and it's, and, um, and if you were, uh, and, and the n number of boys that would have gone to Johnny's, uh, house, um, I mean, I, hundreds, I would say, but I mean, Mabin, what do you think? I mean, this is, it's, it's interesting you should raise this because I think when we were, on location and when Megumi was in the edit, I think this is a conversation we'd come back to often. Um, of course, it is entirely speculative and, and there is a, a world in which we never actually find out as a, as, a, as a public, we'll never know the exact number of people who suffered abuse at the hands of Johnny Kitagawa. I think the, the fact of the matter is, is we do know that there was a, a constant stream of boys and young men joining the talent agency with aspirations to become stars. There were many backing dancers. There were many people kind of, you know, who hadn't made their debut, who never even got there. 
And of course, Johnny Kitagawa had direct access to, to, to many of those individuals, all of those individuals. I think, you know, this is a term that we, we explore in the film. The fact that Johnny Kitagawa's homes were referred to as the dormitory or dormitories even, you know, this was happening at various locations because there were so many boys sleeping over, I think perhaps gives us an indication of the scale of abuse here. And I think that it, it, it's terrifying and it's horrible to think about. I just don't know if we're ever going to be able to put an actual number to it. And also to add to it, it, it's not just, this didn't just happen sort of in its heyday, in the heyday of Johnny Kitagawa. This, there are, there the first ever um, uh, accusation uh, or ele ele sexual allegations towards Johnny Kitagawa happened in the 60s. So this has been going on for decades and he, and he's always been, although there have been these allegations, um, Johnny Kitagawa remained um, in his position and 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 that 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 never changed and no one ever questioned his access his 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 proximity to um young boys all right um last question to you both then um what do you want to happen with this documentary what would you like to see i mean you you haven't had any reaction or much reaction yet in japan you haven't had much reaction from uh <clears throat> from anywhere really in this from any institutions in this country right you've just said there was a phenomenal online reaction what would you like to happen hey do you want um, to go first yeah sure i mean i would like so much to happen um <laughs> but i i think having spoken uh to so many to having spoken to um survivors um closely and for you know over a long period of time i do hope that this will help create an environment where people can speak out um about the abuse that they may have experienced and that th that people in power like johnny kitagawa and the agent uh johnny kitagawa will be held accountable and um uh yeah that they will be held accountable i would i would just add to that so firstly i'd say yeah. You know, just once again, I want to express kind of absolute gratitude and absolute solidarity to everyone that spoke to us and and survivors that haven't spoken to us who perhaps have seen some of the coverage or uh, have seen some of the stuff on online. You know, I, I want to express um, solidarity with those people. In terms of what I want to happen, um, I think public discussion is crucial and I appeal, you know, I'm so grateful to everyone that is is online or in the room today. Um, I think as journalists, it is entirely our job to be fueling that public discussion. This is just personal to, to me. I am somewhat um, flabbergasted by the fact that there is still a company bearing the name Johnny Kitagawa, Johnny and Associates. Uh, the, the head of that company, of course, Judy Fujishima is, is a family member. Of course, everyone that works there at a senior level or any level is still financially benefiting from what Johnny Kitagawa did, and that includes the abuse. And I think for a company to effectively wring its hands of any kind of accountability, uh, any kind of safeguarding is not fair. You know, it's important to say, of course, at the end of the film, uh, Judy Fujishima did provide a statement talking about working within the confines of the law and a new plan for 2023. I certainly don't believe Judy Fujishima or anyone from Johnny and Associates engaged with the allegations in any meaningful way. Of course, they eventually engaged, you know, after multiple calls, emails, after turning up at the office, all of those things, they did engage. I certainly don't think they engaged in any meaningful way. And I think as a company and as a uh, an institution, an organization that still profits to this day from what Johnny Kitagawa did and from the infrastructure he put in place and still has young people within their care working there. I, I would like to see them change their practices and I would like to see a, a, a very public acknowledgement of what happened and a very public acknowledgement of how they can do things better and how they can safeguard. 
Well, thank you very much <coughs> to uh, Mobin Azar and Megumi Inman, the makers of uh, this documentary. Will you just remind people again that the documentary is going to be broadcast in Japan on Saturday? Is that, did I get that right? And multiple yes. times afterwards. <coughs> That's right. Saturday, 10 past six in the evening. And then on Sunday, 10 past five in the morning, 10 past 11 in the morning. And then on Monday at 10 past midnight. All right. Thank you very much. Sorry? Not on major channels. That's on BBC, right? BBC on the World. BBC World News BBC Channel. BBC World News Channel. Thank you. Uh, the comment was, no major news channels are showing it. That's a problem. But uh, presumably what you're hoping is that this will be picked up. Um, thank you so much again. Uh, a reminder that we uh, we have sent out a request to Johnny and Associates, uh, giving them the right to reply. Uh, they have yet to do so. We're waiting for their reply. But uh, if they do, of course, we'll air their comments. Uh, for um, Mobim and Megumi, we do offer uh, a year's lifetime. Sorry, not a lifetime. A year's membership of the club to speakers. I'm waving them here so you can see they're actually in my hand. Uh, so we'll send them to you in the post, and then next time you're in Japan, come and see us again, yep? Most and definitely. All the best with your movie. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You.